my friends, I have been on a journey of husbandry. I went primarily to see at first hand conditions in the drought state. I shall never forget the fields of wheat, so blasted by heat that they cannot be harvested. I shall never forget field after field of corn, stunted, earless, stripped of leaves, for what the sun left, the grasshoppers took. No cracked earth, no blistering sun, no burning wind, no grasshoppers are a permanent match for the indomitable American farmers and stockmen and their wives and children who have carried on through desperate days and inspire us with their self-reliance, their tenacity, and their courage. It was their father's task to make homes it is their task to keep these homes, and it is our task to help them win their fight. Soil health is very important not only for farmers, but for the consumer and the general public because we all like to eat, and I don't think any of us are going to volunteer to give that up anytime soon. There's just example after example of civilizations that their decline has been in large part because they've ruined their soils. They've let their soils erode. The productivity of their country has washed away into the rivers and then they're no longer able to feed themselves. And so from a social standpoint, soil health is incredibly important in order just to sustain our ability to feed not only ourselves, but to feed the world. That's why it's really important for the continued productivity of this country, not only for our generation, but for future generations. That importance then kind of leans over into what is the public perception. And I would say right now, the public doesn't really have a good understanding of soil health. And I can say that because I don't think a lot of farmers have a really good understanding of soil health. Regardless of whether you're organic or conventional or no-till or anything in between, it all has to start with the soil. Even farmers that went to college and took a soil science class, that's mainly all dealing with the physical and chemical properties of the soil. Hardly ever talked about the biological component. And that's what is really missing from a proper understanding of soil health is how important the biology is. The soil is a living organism. If you think about a really healthy soil, there's about 10,000 pounds of biological material below that soil surface. Everything from fungi to bacteria, earthworms, everything else in between. And you total them all up, that 10,000 pounds is about the same as two African elephants. If you imagine two elephants, it takes a lot to feed them. So if you have that much biological activity below the soil surface, it's going to take a lot to feed those as well. From now until 2060, we're going to have to produce as much food as we've produced in the last 500 years. What we eat, other than what comes out of the oceans, is all derived from soil. Soil security is equal to food security. So if we want to make sure that we can feed the world's population, we're going to have to understand how do we make sure that our soil has the capability of producing these crops. I'm Keith Burns, the president and co-owner of Green Cover Seed uh, here in Bladen, Nebraska. Uh, co-own it along with my brother Brian. We've been farming here all of our lives and this land we intend to be able to hand down to our children and grandchildren and so soil health has always been something that's I guess been important to us uh, but probably only since about 2008 have we really you know consciously been making uh, efforts to, to, to really drastically improve it. The atmosphere around us is 78 percent nitrogen but it's unavailable to plants. So this legume plant can't actually take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and utilize it. But what it can do is it can host a very specific type of bacteria on its roots. That's actually 
colonies of rhizobia bacteria that are able to take the atmospheric nitrogen, convert it into forms of nitrogen that a plant can use, and they basically will then sell it or trade it to this plant in exchange for carbon. Plants through photosynthesis produce the carbon. So what we see going on here is a very complex economy going on within the soil where plants are using carbon as a currency to purchase goods and services from the bacteria, from the fungus in the soil, really from all of the biology, but in this case, uh, they're purchasing nitrogen from these bacteria in exchange for the carbon. And that's the whole key to this soil health system. It's, it's really all about the carbon. So carbonomics is a term that hopefully will get people thinking in an economic frame of mind, but using carbon as the currency. And if we could get farmers to think in terms of carbon, or at least understand that carbon is even more important than nitrogen, then the only way to get carbon into the soil is to have a growing plant. You gotta have photosynthesis. If I want more carbon, I have to have plants growing more often. So I can't just have corn and soybeans growing from May through September. I've gotta have a cover crop growing from October through April. And that's where I get the big extra boost of carbon into my system. I've seen great soil health in both organic and conventional settings. I've seen terrible soil health in both conventional and organic settings. Really it comes down to the management practices and, and how the farmer is going to integrate the principles of soil health into their operation. Cover crops are simply crops planted between your cash crops that aren't really planted to be harvested necessarily. They're just there to try to put carbon back in the soil, to utilize sunlight during times of year that our cash crops are not, to protect the soil you know, by providing a living cover to, to shield the soil from erosion. The soil is a living, breathing system. Sometimes we have to feed it a little for it to feed us. And it's like a relationship. If you're in a relationship where all you do is take, 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 and you take the maximum you can at every opportunity, what are the odds of that relationship lasting very long? I'm very, very cautious and conscientious about working the soil, um, not working it too much, trying to put as much organic matter back into the soils through cover cropping as I can. My philosophy is that if I take care of the soils, the soils are going to take care of the vegetables. So I do a lot of cover cropping on the farm, um, on bare ground, if at all possible I have cover crops on it. I do a lot of cover cropping interplanting um, with crops to like bring in beneficial insects. I use a lot of mulch, like as you can see all the straw that's in between the beds. There's a lot of different components that are involved in creating and maintaining healthy soils. From out here, are you done? I got one left. Next is bok choy. And we're gonna do the bok choy next, and it's out in field E. Lettuce, 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 lettuce. Massive heads of lettuce under there. Up, and here we go. Holy moly, they are so gorgeous. Oh my gosh. The heads that you would see at the grocery store are half this size. We're gonna harvest a lot of them. This is my seventh year of farming. I had a ton to learn. I mean, I didn't know anything about farming and raising produce and soil health. And, and, and I still feel like I still do have a ton to learn. The CSA model of farming is why I started farming, and it's what made me passionate about farming. It stands for Community Supported Agriculture. Hi, how are you? Good. So I have members that pay up at the beginning of the year. They pay an upfront fee in exchange for their income to support the farm. My guarantee is that for 24 weeks, the spring, summer, and fall season, that I will provide seven to nine different items in their CSA share that they get every week. People 
are starting to care about and think about where their food is coming from and care about the connection between the person that's growing the food and the food that they're eating. I look at it as a responsibility for me to try to educate my CSA members. You have to start with the big picture before you get into the minutia of soil health. You can't start with why it is that I plant cover crops and the goals that I'm trying to get out of cover cropping. I have to start with this gorgeously beautiful Swiss chard that I bring to the farmer's market and they look at it and go, oh my God, how did you do that? I just, I know that cover cropping is helping to benefit the soils, but it's not something that you're gonna see in a year or two. Building soil is not something that happens quickly. It takes a long time. I mean, when you think about when the glaciers came down like hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that's why we have the soils that we have. We're a certified organic uh, vegetable farm. The whole farm is certified, um, but I'm growing vegetables on about seven acres. If you have a lot of land, you can take an entire field out of vegetable production and just have it in a cover crop or a couple of cover crops for the year, and then next year plant it in vegetables. I don't have that much land. So for me, it's really tricky moving things around. So I, I do a lot of intercropping. One of the most common intercropping things that I do is with a fall brassica crop, I put buckwheat in the pathways and buckwheat, when it flowers, brings in a parasitic wasp, and that wasp feeds on aphids. And aphids are about the biggest pest on fall brassica crops. I'm doing a lot of sort of IPM pest control on the cash crop that I'm growing just by planting this buckwheat that's kind of in between the pathways. My dad started with five acres and we built from there. He built up to 60 acres when he was alive and then I built it up to 120 since he passed away. He's a great farmer for his time, but in his time, the fieldmen would come out from the canneries, he'd say, you need to spray this, you need to spray this on this time, even if there was bugs present, you know, harmful bugs present or not, you had to do it. That's totally changed now. There are field agents out there now with corporations that really understand that there are other methods of controlling the bad bugs, using good bugs, and et cetera. And so I think that's been a really major shift over the past, I'd say 20 years, which is really beneficial to the consumer. That message, in my opinion, has got to come from the farmers right to the general public. And that's what we try to do at our farm stands is, is inform them of how we do things and why we do it. And, uh, and to let them know that, that the food that we provide to them is very, very safe. How's it going? Good, how are you? Hey. I got broccoli. See? <laughs> See what I'm saying? He's asking for broccoli. I got some <laughs> A part of the job of a, of a farmer that, that sells directly to the public is changing public perception or correcting public perception as to what farmers really do. By and large, most of farmers understand that, that soil health is critical to their business. The saying that I like to use is, I'm not really treating the plant, I'm treating the soil. If you treat the soil right and take care of the soil, your crops will come. Our model is 40 different crops. We're always rotating crops around, and, and like I only like to put crops in one patch of soil for three years, and then I automatically rotate it out, whether it's berries, vegetables, or whatever. We plant different varieties of cover crops depending on what's going to be the, the succeeding crop coming up. For instance, we raise a lot of corn, and it takes a lot of nitrogen. So in fields that are going to be going into corn uh, the preceding year, then we go ahead and, and plant an Austrian pea in there, which will fix its own nitrogen. So we have a strong, good nitrogen source in the soil prior to planting and seeding the, the corn crop. And we can really reduce the use of synthetic fertilizers and also just makes the soil much healthier. Very expensive seed costs, but now when you take it the full length of the year and look at the fact that that Austrian pea is actually adding 40 to 50 pounds of nitrogen, then you got to figure out well, what's that saving me in fertilizer costs. Well, corn takes about 120 pounds per acre of nitrogen to really get it to full production and a, a full crop. So I'm cutting my fertilizer bank in half. So I'm only using half the amount of fertilizer that I normally need to use. Then suddenly Austrian pea isn't so expensive. 
there's a value in that, but there's another value in that is less time for me in the field making sure fertilizer is being applied at the appropriate time because it's just there already. And then in other parts of soil that like came out of corn or came out of berries where there's excess nitrogen already in the soil, we'll plant more of a cereal rye variety cover crop because that's a really good absorbing and holding nitrogen in the plant during the winter time and then we can, we can plow that under in the springtime before planting other crops. I keep my farm stand open pretty much year round and keep feeding different crops into that and then that builds my customer base and more and more people come by. I think we need large corporate farms to feed America, but I think we feed society with farms like mine. So five fifty feet. farm is a business, so yield matters and productivity matters, and I fully believe, and I'm sitting up here today because I believe that soil health is, is crucial to productivity, short and long term. I think there's a, a deeply engaged set of consumers that is growing. It's a consumer base that's growing, and I think what they're trying to tell us as a big food company is that food isn't a zero-sum game. As I think about what I heard today, I was blown away by the amount of science. And I know that the science has been there and the research is good, but I was really impressed. And then came this talk of how do we link the science and what we know to creating the economic models that give producers a chance to move forward with some level of confidence. That has to happen. Food alone is not going to drive this. And I just used the corn crop as an example. We grow about 15 billion bushels of corn in this country. Five of it goes in your gas tank. Five of it goes into cows. Two of it goes on ships to somewhere else. You put two of it in the grain bins. I think that leaves us with one. Food seed residual. We're not using a billion bushels of corn to make cereal and tortillas in this country. So if you think about who plays and who benefits from soil health, we all benefit. We're an urban farm in the Dutchtown neighborhood of St. Louis. We are seven miles south of the arch as the crow flies. We have about 70 to 80 varieties of cut flowers that we grow during our season. We're farmer florists, so that means we grow the flowers here and then we design the arrangements for things like weddings, funerals, parties, all that kind of stuff. This is really unusual to have an acre city farm in the heart of St. Louis. We're just wanting to be good stewards of the land. We wouldn't want to be doing anything else. That's why we bought this property, because up the street, they wanted to turn this into a parking lot. When a house is approved for demolition, they don't take away everything, right? They put it into the basement, into the foundation, and then they cover it up with maybe a foot of fill dirt, definitely not topsoil, right? So when we acquired these properties that had houses on them and were demolished, there's no way to till. It's full of rubble um, and bricks, and the soil quality is really low. We're just talking fill dirt, like Missouri clay, yuckity yuck yuck. So what we do is we bring in some soil sometimes. Instead of trying to till in, we're building up. Soil health is really vitally important here on our urban farm. Even though we're just on an acre, we're pretty committed to taking crops out of production, um, and, and replenishing the land with cover crops. So in the back, what we have are the daikon radishes, which run deep into the soil to penetrate and break up any hard pans. The cover crops are also important to um, help prevent erosion because especially on the purchase lots, we have to buy that soil, you know, so we want to hold on to it <laughs> as much as we can. We do our soil testing yearly um, and each year it provides us new information and we just tweak it a little bit more. With organic farming, you just kind of get in this mode of like more compost, more compost, right? Just keep adding compost. And we were doing that. And then our soil test would come back with really high phosphorus, right? Which can happen from just adding tons of compost. It's really hard on me because I'm really <laughs> tempted to add compost every fall, but you know. It really improved the soil. I mean, it was amazing, right? It was amazing. This bed last year 
we had terrible problems with it. So that was from the trucked in soil that we had purchased from an area company. It was so low in nitrogen coming to us that, you know, and we had to compost and we, <laughs> we thought we'd be good to go. The entire area failed. That's when we had to be more proactive about how we're taking care of our soil. For me, it's so important, you know, I mean, just think about it. Whenever you get someone a bouquet, the first thing they do is what? They put their face in it, right? I mean, they put their face in it to smell the flowers. So if you're doing that act of love, why not go that extra step in making sure that it's the healthiest thing that they could possibly buy on the face of the earth. People who are really into growing sustainably and holistically are passionate. And that's what you should be looking for. A farmer who's excited about what they're doing and what they're growing. Remember the lessons of the Dust Bowl, that those images haunt us. We wanna keep the soil in place, we wanna take care of this earth and keep it moving after we're long gone. I think people really are starting to be aware that something is wrong with our environment, with the planet, with, with where we're living. And if we don't start taking care of it now, it's just not going to get any better. One quote from Teddy Roosevelt that challenges each of us to think about our actions and a commitment to soil health now and into the future. If in a given community, unchecked popular rule means unlimited waste and destruction of the natural resources, soil, fertility, water power, force, game, wildlife generally, which by right belong as much to subsequent generations as to the present generation, then it is sure proof that the present generation is not yet really fit for self-control, is not yet really fit to exercise the high and responsible privilege of a rule which shall be both by the people and for the people. The term for the people must always include the people unborn as well as the people now alive, or the democratic ideal is not realized. We're the fourth generation on this farm. Uh, my kids and my brother's kids uh, would be the fifth generation. It's been in our family for well over 100 years. We're all very much attached to the land. One thing we've noticed through soil testing is that over the years, our, our organic matter got drastically low, less than 2%. And, uh, and, and so when you start reaching those particular levels, you just don't have the water holding capacity that the ground really needs to have. And so. We made the decision um, really is about five, six years ago, and talking with my brother, that we really needed to do something different. We made that conscious decision to really get into cover crops and really start building this organic matter back. First two years, we had drought, and, and it really didn't take well for us. Third year, we had a home run with it, and that kind of solidified in our mind that we really needed to continue with this. We consistently see better yields with crops in, in that area, and it's just really, it's a function of the rye grass with its root structure. And if it's water holding capacity, because uh, we have had the dry years through here, but then also we've seen uh, just, you know, better water absorption during when we do have those moments of uh, heavy downpours. One of the things that we're learning more and more how to do is become better observers. Our forefathers were, were great observationists. They had PhDs in it. And, with as fast times that we have today, we really don't take the time to notice changes in, in the environment. And I think we're seeing a lot more because we're taking more time to observe what's really going on around us. A lot of people call the microbes 
sort of the black box. It's, it's the unknown territory, and there's so little that we know, but we understand that they're very important in soil ecology. Most people can count up to 150 in about 30 seconds. So if you were to sit down and try to count all the microorganisms in this tablespoon of soil, without stopping and having absolutely no breaks, it would take you about six and a half years. People know that legumes are nitrogen-fixing plants, but what they don't always know is that it's really the microbes that are associating with the legumes that are doing the nitrogen fixation. Without the microbes, the plants aren't going to be, be healthy. And so just understanding that link between the microbial community and the plant is something most people aren't aware of. We think of the DNA of the soil microorganisms as their genetic potential. Because they have the potential doesn't mean that they're performing that function. So an analogy would be just because you have a bicycle doesn't mean that you're riding it. And it's the same thing with soil microorganisms. They have the genetic potential through their DNA to perform a certain function, but they may or may not be doing that. And so we need to find methods that focus on what the microorganisms are actually doing in the soil. We have a lot of risks in terms of our food supply and, and making sure that we manage all of that and keep it sustainably moving forward by regenerating the soils that are having issues right now is so critically important. Every producer, every, every rancher, every farmer out there is ultimately a livestock grower. Now, whether you know that or you don't, you've got livestock, they're just microscopic. And that's what keeps our system moving, producing, functioning as that vital living ecosystem to provide everything that we need as a human race in order to survive. Hello. Hello. Howdy. Hi, Lee. Good to Thank see you, you again. Your hospitality. Oh, well, it's awesome. my pleasure. Anybody tell me what temperature microbes really like? Where are they at their peak efficiency? I'm on agronomy majors. Hmm. We need to adjust the curriculum, it sounds like. 75 degrees, they're just like us. When it gets colder or hotter, they start to slow down and get lazy and not want to work. So, anybody tell me what the temperature is likely to be in a bare soil tillage system? It's not uncommon to see that get up over 100 degrees. What happens to microbial activity at that point? Done. They're on vacation, not doing anything. What is the temperature in that same field if we've got a, a rye thatch laid down? We can gain 20 to 30 degrees and retain our moisture and eliminate evaporative loss by having that, that mulch barrier there. We're using uh, these complex cover crop cocktails, mixtures of three to 13 different plants. It's kind of like having a good party. When you have a party, do you just invite all the dudes over that you know? Or is it funner when the girls come and maybe they bring some of their friends and maybe get some international students to come? And all of a sudden now, you've got a pretty fun party, right? That's a lot better than you and the guys sitting around watching Monday Night Football, I'm guessing. Well, these cocktails are kind of the same thing. The more things we put in there, the better it gets. Most of the problems that plague modern agriculture are really a result of a lack of diversity. Nature abhors a monocrop. Nowhere in nature do you see a monocrop. We're imposing our will on nature and her response to that over time is things like resistant weeds and bugs and disease and so forth. When we start to bring the diversity back it's incredible how quickly a lot of these problems go away. So our goal when we farm is we never want to see the soil unless we go looking for it. We think this is beautiful right here. We've got all of this straw left over from the triticale crop that was harvested back in July. So in addition to this great thatch of cover that we have uh, with this triticale residue, we planted these, these sunflowers in here along with the, with the cover crop. So this is kind of a dual purpose 
Uh, we're we're going to harvest the sunflowers for a cash crop. I've got cow peas growing in here, Austrian winter peas, flax, we have buckwheat, we've got squash. Uh, there's about 10 different companion cover crops growing right with the sunflowers. And that's what's giving me additional soil benefits through the great diversity that I have because I get the best of both worlds. You know, it's kind of like having your cake and eating it too. You know, I've got the cake with the sunflowers that I'm going to harvest, but I'm eating the cake too because I've got all of the benefits of the diversity growing down underneath it. And uh, just from the way this, this field looks, I think this cake is going to taste pretty good. For the farmer who's willing to put the effort into finding the markets, making the markets or hauling to the markets, there's huge potential in, in doing this type of system because I guarantee you this will add you know, 15 to 20 bushels on my corn yield next year because of all the great diversity that I had here versus just being a corn soybean rotation. Three cash crops in two years uh, plus eight or 10 cover crops uh, during the same time period really is gonna help the soil health uh, uh, score on, on this particular farm here. Really, really interesting. Well, look and see. Look at this. Here's part of our insect control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right there. Look yeah, at that yeah. guy. I saw a couple in the, in the field. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know that's like there's. I wish I had more of the spiders because there's what's left of a grasshopper. Uh -huh. If I had more of those, I'd have less of this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so the more spiders we can have, the better off we are, as long as they're not in my house because uh -huh. my wife doesn't like them. <laughs> yeah. That's a girl. We have a big family. My wife and I, we have, we have seven children. Next generation is coming. There's a bunch of grandkids running around now. So when we make farming decisions, we, we definitely think about what's this going to do for the future because we want to be able to turn the, the land over to them in, in, in really good condition. But at the same time, you have to make money. You, you know, there's a lot of a lot of families to support through through the farm and through the seed business. So we also have to make decisions that are economically sound. It doesn't do you any good if you have the healthiest soil in the world if you go broke doing it. The living cover crop has made our soils healthier. We didn't do this based on building soil health. We did it on building yield so we could become more economically viable. The net effect is that the soil appears healthier. We like no-till. What that allows us to do is have a better paid, fewer employees, a better job. Um, we're using less fuel. We're buying less equipment. So no-till, we've always figured, was kind of the answer. That's the best way to farm. We seed the cover crop like a crop now, so we're trying to get it nice and even. And what that's doing is allowing our corn to come up nice and even so that we get the even ear sizes, we don't get the runts and all that stuff that we used to get that we're often associated with with a typical no-till scenario. And consistency is what it's all about. That's the hard part, is trying to get this field consistent. What we were doing is spraying our fields as early as we could. We'd kill them off. We couldn't yield with our conventionally tilled fields in high yielding environments. Under a gravelly field, low organic matter field, the yields would be comparable, but we could never beat it with no-till. Now that we're planting green and getting this stability in our soils, now we're finally starting to kind of bridge that gap of no-till versus conventional. So I think that what we're doing is kind of combining technology, chemicals, you know, kind of this commercial style of family farming, and then incorporating that with utilizing a lot of what the, the organic folks have learned over the years and what people used to do 50 years ago and kind of taking that to the next level. So in this field, we were harvesting the corn and then running the air seeder right behind it. So the, the idea is to always have something growing. You can still see a little bit of green in these plants. So they were alive just not too long ago. I'm standing right in the middle of between what's been planted and what hasn't been planted. On this side, we just harvested, but we have not drilled. And on this side, we have drilled. And you can barely tell the difference. The stocks are, are knocked down a little bit. But the whole idea of no-till is to leave all the residue on top. We use an air seeder, a drill that has a single disc opener so that it does not disturb any soil. So as you can see, there's, there's very little soil disturbance. And, and that helps protect 
the soil. It helps with water infiltration, keeping that residue on top of the ground. You can tell really healthy soil by the insects, by worms, and then just you want that uh, soil to almost look like chocolate cake. And uh, this, this has got good moisture. We've had good moisture here in the last couple weeks, so the, our cover crop should come up real well. Right here is where one of the slots from the drill is, and you can barely tell that it's there, which is what we want to help give a little more armor to the soil. In the last 100 years, we've oxidized over half our organic matter into the atmosphere, primarily through tillage. We've lost half of the, the basic building block that makes soil productive, half of it's gone. And we haven't been at this very long in the terms of the life of the soil. I mean, in Indiana, maybe we've been tilling the soil to some degree for 200 years, and we've been doing it intensively for the last 50. Project what will happen if we continue that. The good news here, though, is that there are so many win-win-wins. Very seldom in life do we find win-win-win scenarios, truly. So when we quit tilling, when we build our organic matter, our production goes up, our costs go down, we clean up the rivers, lakes, oceans, we keep the off-site pollution problems from happening. I mean, all these things come together. Those are the reasons why we want to do it. You know, my goal personally is before I become part of the earth again, I would like to see our organic matters be what they were before man came along. And I think if, uh, if I'm fortunate enough to get another 15 or 20 years, I think we can do that. We've documented now that with what we've been doing, we can add about a percent every five years. And I think if we bring grazing into the equation and more multi-species type cocktails to graze them on and so forth, that we can improve even that. But, but. Ah. We're in the process of expanding our, our livestock operation. We've got about 40 cows. We hope to be up to a couple hundred within three years. When we run cattle on the ground, it really increases the soil health much quicker than when there's no livestock involved. The trampling effect, the, uh, the biting and the chewing of the plants, the plants react differently when they're being grazed versus when they're just being cut like with a mower and they'll regrow more aggressively. Uh, the integration of all of the saliva and the, the dung and the urine, those all are increasing the biological activity of the soil. And, and we see much faster gains in soil health when we properly integrate the livestock. The holy grail of soil health has always been, can we do organic no-till? You know, because that's the best of both worlds. We don't have to do any tillage, but we also don't have to use any, any chemicals. It's really, really hard to do because you're growing this cover crop, which we need to build up the soil, but somehow we have to kill it. And without chemicals or without tillage, then what are your options? So the options are, number one, you, you can use a roller crimper, or you can try to smash that plant and to, to really damage that stem so that that plant goes ahead and dies. We want to get it knocked to the ground so the sunlight can, can hit those young corn plants when they come up. Or you can use cattle and either one of them, the timing is exceptionally critical if you're going to really get a good kill on that cover crop. It's a completely different mindset of, of how you run livestock. You, you don't just turn them out in a pasture, check them once a week, and then at the end of the summer you round them up and you, know, you bring them home. Uh, it's, it's being out there every day, moving them every day. So we've, we have a lot of work to do on, on figuring out some of the infrastructure of being able to make that work well. Uh, but we're convinced that it's the way to go. Managing for improved soil health probably has one of the most profound 
impacts on society that we've had in agriculture in a long time. No farmer wants to lose their nutrients. They, they don't. No farmer wants their soil to become degraded. However, there's a huge demand on our agricultural system uh, from the globe actually and there's going to continue to be a huge demand. I've worked for the USDA now for 35 years and never have I seen among farmers such a broad quest for knowledge as, as I'm seeing now. Farmers willing to share their best kept secrets with other farmers is, is a very, very refreshing part of this job. You wouldn't find that in many businesses across this country. A wish that I would have is that more farmers would pay attention to their bare ground. My steeper ground over here, my Marionberry ground, is a permanent cover crop in it. it. We never take it out ever. It stays there. Our farm is uniquely situated on two watersheds. We're sitting right now at the crest of my farm. To the north over here, heading north, is the Johnson Creek watershed, which feeds into Johnson Creek, the Willamette River, and eventually the Columbia River. And then to the south, on the opposite side, that watershed goes into Noyer Creek. Noyer Creek actually starts here at my farm, and then that dumps into Clackamas River drainage. That too is a very productive salmon, and especially steelhead run up in there. And so we have to be aware of that. Noyer Creek, again, the headwaters right here at the farm, it's under investigation right now by the EPA. What they've found is, is high levels of fertilizers and pesticides in it. They now know that the problem is farther down in other areas that you don't have cover crop strategies. Cover crop strategies that we use in the permanent cover crops and the steeper slopes over here about my farm has kept everything right here in place. Let's be concerned about the soil, making sure it stays put as much as we can possibly because without the soil we don't have food. There just won't be any and so we all got to be concerned about soil health, quality of it and the depth of it. Like I said before, you don't feed the plants, you feed the soil. Well, that's true in every aspect. Uh, whether you're a home gardener and using compost, or whether you don't have a home garden, you just have a yard. Watch how you treat your yard. Make sure you don't have runoff leaving your property. That's pretty key to stop uh, soil erosion and runoff into the bays and estuaries and things like that. So it's critical for all of us to be thinking about soil health and keep it in place. La historia personal viene desde que era niño, allá en México. Mis abuelos también uh, cultivaban. En aquel tiempo con mi, mis abuelos cultivaban maíz, pero al mismo tiempo cultivaban frijol y squash. En el mismo tiempo y en el mismo terreno. Y se hacía muy bien. Pues, ¿qué hace el frijol? El frijol, la raíz del frijol, te produce nitrógeno. ¿Qué hace el squash? El squash tiene una raíz este, profunda y gruesa. Lo que hacía el squash, te abría el suelo para que el agua penetrara mejor. Y entonces, los tres cultivos utilizaran mejor el agua. En aquellos tiempos, yo estoy hablando de los años uh, ley 50, se si hacía eso allá. En aquel tiempo, lo sabían ellos, pero no tenían la manera de, de demostrarlo. Ahora tenemos este, una tecnología que lo podemos demostrar. We really see 
the good benefits that the cover crops has year after year. We farm around 4,000 acres. That's about one third of the farm. We have permanent crops like almonds and pistachios. Then another two thirds with raw crops that we grow fresh market tomatoes, fresh garlic. Right now, uh, like see, you see California sunny and everything, but this is December. So far, you know, we don't have no rain at all. Usually we have one or two showers, but it's dry, dry. This area right here, we are more, more or less like a desert. Uh, we average about, uh, about six inches of rain every year. And these soils that we have, uh, cover crops and everything, the rain stays in the soil, doesn't run out like it used to run years ago because the cover crops protect the soil. A few years back, uh, I got invited to go to the White House. I got honored because the soil helped and changing you know, climate change and agriculture too. It's tough to change but the neighbors see that it's beneficial. And that's why you see more and more farmers using cover crops. I've been working in the ag industry all my life. I've launched new products into new market segments like many of you. But I've never been part of helping to create a whole new segment of life science that spans the complete biome from life below the ground to the life above the ground. The development of something of this magnitude requires leadership from all ends of the spectrum in order to shepherd the understanding and the acceptance of new information and technology. This information and technology over time will completely transform the agricultural industry. It's going to transform the entire agricultural industry. And it's already happening as I speak. The health of our soil and the caretakers of our soil will be the topic of national debate and the focus of concerned and active consumers. Because we know that as many continue to reawaken the public, that the answer to many of the serious issues we currently face as society, climate adaptation, safe and affordable food, and clean water, all begins and depends on the health of the soil. Farmers in Maryland are by far and away the most highly cover cropped in the country, but most of it is because of the state cost share program. I think the reason Maryland has such a strong cover crop program in a lot of ways is based on the collaboration of the environmental community with the farming community. And part of the, the whole history of Harborview has to do with collaborating with the environmental community. Um, not just Harborview, but the farmers, um, in the community around us, uh, particularly in the northeast portion of the state, as well as the state as a whole. It started about 20 years ago, um, was kind of the big when everything kind of hit the fan, so to speak, between farmers and environmentalists. We had a fisteria outbreak in the Chesapeake Bay, and we had a huge fish kill. The problem in the water clearly starts on the land. The science around it determined that they thought it was from the phosphorus running off the fields of the farmers. At that point, we were kind of at an impasse. Are we going to fight or are we going to come together? When you battle, you don't really tend to accomplish things. So at that point, I think we kind of started to collaborate. And the Bay Foundation said, well, what, what can we do to help you? So, well, you know, what, what, what do we, how do we change? We're doing the same thing we've done for 20 years. We don't think there's anything wrong with it. So what, what, what can be done? You know, what is there? So then they, they determined that cover crops were kind of the answer. If you do cover crops and you pull the nutrients up out of the soil in the fall when the soil is still alive and you get most of your infiltration, you've got a little bit of excess nitrogen there, you've got a little bit of phosphorus there, you pull it up and you don't get it into the waterways and into the groundwater. So it's a pretty simple, you know, it's pretty easy to understand. But farmers said, well, we're not going to do cover crops. You know, we don't have enough money. You know, the farming's tough. You know, it's the, the early 90s. You know, we didn't have $6 corn. I mean, you know, it was tough. we're not going to spend an extra amount of money. So they said, well, what if we get cost share for it? 
you had the Farm Bureau and the environmental groups both going to the state legislature saying, hey, we need this. We have also appropriated $2 million emergency funds for a state-only pro program to help uh, Maryland farmers with a winter cover crop. Our solution is going to be on the land, and it's not going to be an easy solution. We're going to have to take decisive action. I believe it will be expensive. Uh, I believe it's going to take some political courage for us to require what must be done. Through that collaboration, we were able to get dedicated funding to pay us to do cover crops. Um, that program's been going on for 20 years, but there's a, some very good groups of the environmental community, and there's some very good groups of the farm community that have managed to, to really work this thing out and uh, actually make a difference in the water system. We're very, very proud of um, the farmers in this state and what they've been able to accomplish. It's just remarkable. One of the things that most people may not know about some of the people that work at the Maryland Department of Agriculture is we are farmers. I myself am a farmer, me and my husband tend about 75 to 100 acres. I've been with the Department of Agriculture for 17 years and of those 17 years I've been with the cover crop program for about 11 to 12. Our base payment for cover crop is $45 an acre. They can plant it aerially, they can plant it using a no-till planter, they can do a conventional um, where the ground is disked and then seeded. They can um, also do a process where they um, spread the seed with a spin spreader and then go in and disk behind it. We've tried to look at all the different options that the farmer already uses so that we're not putting him um, at a disadvantage for how to get the cover crop planted. We offer incentives for um, different species. When we started adding the additional incentives and prioritizing um, certain best management practices, the program has just grown. It's grown considerably just in the last five years. Right now, our actual budget is um, over $20 million a year for the cover crop program, and, and that comes from different sources, um, Chesapeake Bay Restoration Fund and that sort of thing, because that's our, one of our primary goals is protecting the bay. The bay means a lot to Maryland, not just as um, a benefit for water quality, but I mean, there's tourism, recreation, food. One of the main things is just a, a quality of life. I mean, it's, it's amazing to live where we live, to have the bay on one side of the shore and the, the ocean on the other. So we're very fortunate in that respect. significant for me as a farmer to realize that all around this island there is literally water that could have ran off my farm. Hey, a couple of years yeah. since we saw each other. Yeah. I'm just curious, just wondering, um, we've spent Oh, the last 20 years or so, I mean, I personally have been using cover crops and trying to keep my soil from eroding and trying to keep the nutrients in the land, particularly the nitrates, so they don't get into the Chesapeake Bay and, and disrupt everything there. Are you seeing any changes over the last 5, 10, 15 years? Is it getting better? Is I, it believe getting worse? The, I believe the bay is healthier than it, than it has been. I can see an improvement. I mean, really? uh, yep. Um, the sea grasses are increasing. Now this year they're late because of the cool right. weather, but right. uh, sea grasses are increasing. Uh, okay. The blue crab population is doing well, really? and so are, so are the oysters. The bay looks healthier than it's been in five or six years. Wow, boy, that is really encouraging. Yeah, it because is. There has been uh, a huge effort, and I think it's well known that the Chesapeake Bay has been kind of like a pilot project for yeah. the nation. Yeah, right. And we know that there's, uh, everyone lives in a watershed. Yeah. And if uh, we're starting to see some success here, that is definitely and a good sign that we're headed in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. So when it was, we'll say the worst, eight to 10 years ago, were there people getting out of the business? Yeah, that, people were leaving the business and they, they just couldn't make a living at it. Yeah. I remember when you would go out oystering and mm -hmm. working 
pretty much the full the full time period, like to two two p.m. Right. from sunrise to two p.m. You would you could only catch three or four bushels of oysters. Hmm. Of course, you know oysters and crabs is what keeps the ball rolling there. Yeah. I mean that's what we're about. It's like corn and soybeans. Yeah, that's how we put food on the table. Right. That's how we put kids our kids through college yeah. and. Right. And it takes a lot of oysters and crabs to put kids through college these days. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> so, How many square miles is this island? Of course, it's mostly marshland, okay. but Tangier's about maybe a mile wide mm -hmm. by two and a half to three miles long. Okay. Not very big. You Not, had mentioned there's three ridges. Three ridges. I have to ask, how high are these ridges? The, the highest point is probably about four feet above <laughs> sea level. So what do you say is the rate of water approaching the island per year? I, it, it varies, but like like here, we probably lost probably 10 feet since uh, last last fall. And like I say, you can see how close it's getting. You really don't have the yeah. have the land to give up. Are you optimistic about the future? I am optimistic. Yeah, I tell our citizens as mayor and. Yeah. As a, a crabber, uh, yeah. not to lose hope, because if you lose hope, you know, then all is lost. Right. You don't want to lose hope. Like we were talking about protecting your soil. I mean, yeah. It, yeah, it's just a common sense yeah. thing. You would want to right. protect the topsoil because it's vital to farm and like our shoreline is right. vital to us. Where I'm from, in the southeastern part of Pennsylvania, that uh, at least 60% of the fields have something growing in it over winter. Yeah, and that, right. I'd say years ago, it was 15 or 20% maybe, and that's really improved. But the thing of it is, there are parts of the country, of the, of the, of the U.S., that's only one or two or 3% okay. covered now. Yeah. And, and so I think using what we've accomplished here in the Chesapeake Bay, hopefully is going to stimulate yeah, right. more of this to, to help clean up our watersheds yeah. in the future. We've got to stay up on top of it because uh, farmers like the watermen, we're feeding the world. Well, we made the loop. Yeah, we made the loop. Like I said, you'll always end up to the same place. <laughs>